Hey, Kate, what did you eat last night? I went out to an Italian place before a, an opening night of a show I was coaching with my friend Jennifer, and we split a couple things, one of which was a white pizza with pesto, basically, as the sauce, mm. and sun-dried tomatoes and maybe some chicken in a wood-fired, thin, you know, thin crust wood-fired oven that they do right there, and it was pretty good. Okay. It, it, I don't know why it wasn't as good as I sort of hoped it would be, but I think it might be in contrast to the pasta dish, which was so good. It was just chicken sun-dried tomatoes in a tomato cream sauce, I think was what it was, with bow tie pasta or something. But the sauce is, I, I dream about this pasta. It is so incredibly wow. tasty. Yeah, it sounds like not, not much could live up to that. Yeah, so I pretty much can't get anything else when I'm at that restaurant except for that pasta. But this time, <laughs> I was like, oh, I want to try their pizza. And she was like, well, let's share. So it worked out. It was great. <laughs> when you described the pizza to me, it sounded wonderful. It was. It probably was yeah. even better than I think. It's just that it wasn't as good as the pasta. Right, right, right. The I pesto get that. wasn't, I don't know, it wasn't, the pesto wasn't as flavorful as I wanted it to be somehow. Hmm. I get that. Maybe because they baked it and it got real brown. Right. You know, so it lost its freshness. I think that mm -hmm, might have been it because mm -hmm. it wasn't under anything. I think it was just on top. Oh, okay. Yeah. How about you? What did you have? I, I made a sweet potato mashup. That's all I can call it. Mm. I was desperate to cook something and I had very little in my refrigerator. So in an iron skillet, I basically put ghee and then garlic and then onion. And then I shredded the sweet potato on top. Added some oregano and thyme and just let that go until it got nice and crispy. And then once that was done, I just scooted that to the side and then cracked two eggs in there and made two eggs over easy. It was really tasty. That combination of the sweet potato, the onion, the garlic, with that great ghee taste, and then slathering a couple eggs on top, it made me really happy. It seems like a power dish to me. Mm -hmm. It's like, wow, I really need to make this more. And often I only use sweet potatoes. I always buy them. I'm always hopeful that I'm going to use them. But somehow it's always the last thing in my fridge and I'm just use it out of desperation. Yeah. But I'm like, I need to eat more of these. Yeah. <laughs> That's great. Yeah. Sweet potato. I make a sweet potato hash with eggs that has chipotle in it from Bobby Flay. Mm. It's really tasty. Mm. Mm -hmm. I almost put in the uh, Trader Joe Trader Joe soy riso, but I decided not to. Mm, no, good good choice. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Welcome to another episode of You Won't Believe What I Ate Last Night. I am Rick Fiore. And I'm Kate DeVore. And this is our ongoing conversation about food, health, weight management, and our endeavor to be and stay healthy in a really tasty world. With love, kindness, and compassion towards ourselves and others. Hey, Kate, I was wanting to ask you, has anyone ever said something to you where they really just complimented you, said great things about you, and told you how good you make them feel? Sure. And what does that do to you? How does it, what does it cause in you? Uh, it, it feels nice to be appreciated. Yeah. And that's what we want you people to do when you go and rate and review us. <laughs> <laughs> rate, make us feel appreciated. No, not really. <laughs> Say some nice things on iTunes because you know it sort of expands and goes forward and out from there. And other people will see that and be like, oh my God, we've got to check out this podcast. Go check it out. You should do it. Everyone should be listening. So when you're Absolutely. done, please do that. Give us some stars. Give us some compliments. And most importantly, word of mouth is the most important thing we have. So tell your friends about us. Absolutely. And speaking of friends making us feel good, we want to give a shout out to Kitty for her support. Thank you, Kitty. She has been a great friend of the podcast lately and very supportive. And we are really appreciative. Thank you so much. We're happy to have you listening. So today we're talking about four important things. Salt, fat, acid and heat and we got this idea because there's this netflix series and a book by Samin nosrat which has been really popular lately and kate and i have really loved it and she basically talks about salt fat acid heat and she really talks about this idea that if you really master these four things how it's going to transform your cooking so kate and i have been talking a lot i feel like you and i have been talking a lot lately about what really works for us in the kitchen what makes us, makes us successful. And I feel like from my own perspective, when I really pay attention to like what I do well, what I can do well, and what I like, it really, really makes a difference in how much I cook and how much I want to cook and what I cook. And I sort of feel like what's so great about this idea of salt, fat, acid, heat, 
I feel like unknowingly before I came across the way she's branded it, I think those things have really over the past year made such a difference in my life. And they've made me want to cook more because I feel like I do understand them more. And I feel like once you do get these basic things under your belt, I'm like, God, it really just it makes me want to cook more. Yeah, this cookbook, you all, Salt, Fat, Acid, Heat, that Samin Nosrat wrote is absolutely beautiful. My friend Star gave this to me a couple of years ago, and I didn't really delve into it for whatever reason. And then the net- <laughs> then it came on TV, and so, <laughs> good Lord, how embarrassing, but it's true. Where we learn then- everything nowadays. <laughs> Ah, uh, I wouldn't read the book, but I would watch it on Netflix. I spent four hours watching it, and I could have What's probably this read thing the book with in words that amount you of time. Say? Oh, and it's a beautiful book with beautiful illustrations as well. But the Netflix series is brilliant. It's a four-part series. They're each an hour long, and she has one part for each of the salt, fat, acid, heat. And it is amazing and so informative. And then the book goes even deeper. So if you're looking for a cookbook to help you learn really valuable principles yes there's a bunch of recipes in there that are amazing Mm -hmm. but really the thing that's amazing about this whole structure is the principles of how to cook and if you can master these four things you will master cooking and Samin Nosrat is a genius and I absolutely highly couldn't recommend the book highly enough and certainly the Netflix series is totally awesome she's super down to earth and I sort of feel like she's anti-cooking shows when you look at look at her like, to me, when I look at her, I'm like, there's, in a weird way, there's no reason she should be on TV <laughs> or have her own series when <laughs> she doesn't fit the mold that I think most of these shows are looking for. So I really love that about her. And she inspires yeah. me that way. And she's yeah, also and- like, I think she just thinks she's more, she's like us. She's like our people. I was going to say, we also would like to be friends with her. So if you're listening, <laughs> Samin, please uh, reach out because we want to be your best friend. We won't stalk you or anything. <laughs> no, but I want to come to your house and eat that meal that you make at the end of the heat episode. <laughs> I want to meet your mother. <laughs> oh, my God. I want to meet your mother, too. It reminded me of cooking with my mother. She had a thing with her mother. It was great. <sighs> yeah. So book and Netflix series, highly recommended. And uh, we're, we're going to just talk a little bit about those elements from, from our own perspective. Yeah. Um, one of the things... So, go ahead. No, go ahead. I said one of the things that she... One of the comments she had made in an interview is that she says it's really important that she wants the world of cooking to be so much smaller than it is for everyday mm. people. And I really resonated with that because I'm one, as you know, I get really overwhelmed when I think about, oh my God, all the things I need to do or figure out or the things I need to know. So what I like is how she breaks that down. And um, she, what's the other great thing I liked about her is she apprenticed at Chez Panisse, which is that sort of great, um, which is really one of the first famous uh, fast uh, farm to table restaurants started by Alice mm-hmm. Waters in Berkeley, Cali- mm-hmm. California. And she apprenticed there. And she said what was so. And worked there. Yes, yes, yes. Think, and what was she? so. Yeah. Yes. And the, she started there when she was 18 or 19, didn't know anything about food. And she said what was so interesting is that every day they wouldn't cook from recipes. They wouldn't cook from books. But when they sat down and talked about recipes and had their daily meetings, the conversation would always come back to just a couple things. They'd be like, oh, this recipe needs a little more salt. Um, this thing needs a little bit more flavor, meaning fat. Or we really, really need to counter this taste, which would mean acid. Or how are we going to cook this one? And she said that's where this whole genesis really started and how she learned to cook. And I sort of love that idea, that freedom that you can start to give yourself as you start to think about expanding your cooking repertoire as it was. Yeah, and it's like learning the primary colors and then (laughs) how you can combine them into making any color. And she's remarkably down to earth, which I like about her. In the way that Julia Child was, we don't think of her that way anymore, but at the time, she was remarkably down to earth and and very practical. And she was the first person putting her hands in the food and stuff. And and I I love that element about the way uh, Samin talks about things, too. Do you remember how Julia Childs would do those really long takes? There wasn't a whole lot of editing. (laughs) She would literally almost mm-hmm. like make an entire recipe right in front of you. <laughs> mm-hmm. So, K- Kate, do you like salt? <laughs> yes, <laughs> um, I do, and I feel very strongly about its use. Uh, and and as if you are a longtime listener, you will know that Rick and I actually did an entire episode about salt. So, if you're interested, you can go back and listen to that. Although now I feel like it would be a whole different episode now that I've read this and and have this information because there's so much more to say yes, about it than we even totally. said in that episode. Good point. Yeah. And the thing I love about it is, and this is what Samin says, is that salt makes food taste more like itself. It doesn't add flavor. It brings out the flavor. And I think it's 
the most important element. And when you watch all these cooking shows, people are always like, it's under-seasoned, it's under-seasoned, yeah. which usually means there's not enough salt. And I, when I eat, I tend, I feel like I maybe, maybe a little bit more sensitive to salt because I feel like a lot of times for me, things are generally oversalted. And I think that's just me because I don't think anyone else tends to have a problem. But sometimes when I see them on the cooking shows and I see how much salt they're throwing in, I am like, oh my gosh, that is so much salt in a dish. Mm-hmm. And it blows yeah. my mind. So it really and does, po- like a lot of salt really helps. And part of what the other thing is about that is when we see them on the cooking shows, they might be using a particular type of kosher salt, which is the kind I have in my cabinet, which is diamond crystal, which is the largest flake. And so it has a third as much saltiness as other salts, Mm, you know, mm -hmm. so the kind of salt you use has a huge impact. So if the recipe just says salt, you really have to figure it out and taste it because table salt is different than kosher salt. And even among between the two primary leading brands of kosher salt, one of them is twice as much as the other in a spoonful. Yeah. So a tablespoon of salt is not a tablespoon of salt. It really varies. Did you know that's her favorite type of salt too, the diamond crystal? I believe that, yes, I did know that, and that made me happy. I believe that, I think I started using it because my mom told me to, Mm. (laughs) because I think that that's commonly like the base salt. Right. Um, And she described it as like the least salty of salts. Mm -hmm. And And so you need a whole handful. And this whole idea that there are just so many different types of salt, and you have to figure out which ones you like, like what degree of saltiness and know how to use them. The other thing I've really learned with salt over the years for my cooking, which I think has helped me cook more and eat better is the idea of like when to salt. That Mm -hmm. salting just doesn't happen once. It doesn't happen Mm -hmm. twice. It actually Mm -hmm. happens along the way because you put salt in, right? It dissolves. It adds to the flavor. But then when you put other things in, well, then those other flavors, whether, you know, whatever else you're adding in, that needs to be brought out a little bit more. So I think that's a really important idea. Yeah, yeah. You got to season in layers, right? Mm Mm-hmm. And the the other thing about timing is when when it comes to meat, there is a huge relevance to when you salt your meat. Mm, mm -hmm, If you salt it and let it sit, it's going to have one impact. If you let it sit for an hour, it'll have one effect. If you let it sit for three days, it'll have a different effect. If you salt it immediately before cooking, it has a different effect. Yeah. So it it makes a difference. And I don't know about you, Kate, but I just think for me, I feel like what we're always talking about, or one thing I've always gotten from our conversations that I think has been brought forth is, for me, is how do you bring more flavor into your food? Because for me, I have to have so much flavor in my food to really, really enjoy it. And I just think this is an easy way to do it. It's an easy way to like, just remember, make sure you like what you're eating, right? Make sure it has flavor and it draws you to it and you want to eat it and you want to eat more of it. I was just thinking. I've never made anything without a lot of flavor. Mm. I was just thinking about that. These soups that I served last night, I served a meal out of my freezer last night to my friend Cheryl and it was five different soups. (laughs) And all of them were so intensely flavored in different ways. I was noticing, I'm like, I do very heavy flavoring. (laughs) It's Mm. so true. Yeah. She says this great thing about the... um, the less time food spends in water, the saltier the water needs to be. So that's like a good thing for mm-hmm. pasta. So if something's going to simmer for quite a long time, you maybe, you know, you don't need as much food if it's just going to simmer for a short amount of time. I thought that was really salt. helpful as a tip. Yeah. And they always say salty like the ocean. Mm-hmm. That's what your water needs to be for pasta, but not for rice because that's going to be absorbed. Yes. So obviously you you kind of consider what's going to happen in that water. And right, for some for fresh pasta, you show it to the water for, you know, you just say hello and give it a little dip and that's pretty much it. <laughs> so that water has to be really salty really to have salty. any impact. I was also yeah. thinking how, you know, you got to remember that all these vegetables, they have like little cells, right? They have their own little membranes. And once they start cooking, they open up a little bit. So they're ready to receive salt. And I was thinking, oh, isn't that sort of like, this is a terrible like metaphor, but I think, isn't that sort of like when we get a cut and if you ever accidentally got something salty in it, <laughs> you know what I mean? And it just stings. And it's so, you have such the ability when your cells are really open to absorb and really feel and really mm-hmm. have that intense feeling. So I thought, oh, that's so interesting what like vegetables must go through and meat must go through is they just receive mm. it. And they're like, oh my God. It's exactly what we need. Open us up. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> and apparently it moves through food using both osmosis and diffusion. It's very clever. Does it? Is salt. It does. Yes. It, Kate, that's what it says in the book. You and your fancy science words. <laughs> <laughs> it's from the book. Oh, okay. <laughs> I I have the book. Rick doesn't. So I have the little details. Yeah. Um, 
It's also amazing to consider how many kinds of salt there are. Totally. Salt is not salt is not salt. There are hundreds of hundreds. kinds of salt. And we've been finding they becoming they become trendy in the last few years. So I have, you know, I've been given yeah. gifts of little tiny containers of different kinds of salt and I I'm not so convinced about, you know, sometimes I can tell a difference. Certainly the first time I tried Fleur de Sel, mm-hmm. which is the, you know, the flower of the salt, very salty salt, I was blown away because of how different it was. Um, but some of the other ones, like the pink Himalayan versus that, I'm not sure that I'm necessarily noticing that big of a difference. But it might just be that I haven't uh, tried. But in the show, she's in Japan, and there's like, what What do they have, like how many hundreds of kinds? I couldn't keep up. I was so oh. overwhelmed. And isn't this the great luxury of where we are right now, is that you can go to a store or online, and you can spend an hour looking through what type of salt that you want. <laughs> the same way you can with all the pasta sauces and all the olive oils that are out there. It blows my mind. Yeah. Yeah. So salt is essential and it it makes your food taste like food. Also, for people that are looking to cut back on salt, the place to do it isn't by only using half a teaspoon instead of a full teaspoon in your pot of soup. It's the, the sodium that's killing you is then when you're going out for a burger yeah. the next day. You know, so a little... You know, keeping the big picture in mind and not being like, I don't want to have that much sodium. Yeah, and I'm more... Season it so it tastes good. Yes, totally. And I actually think I'm more conscious about sodium when I go out. But when I'm at home, I don't really worry about it. But I am conscious about, obviously, processed foods and foods and restaurants. That's the only place I get a little bit more conscious about it. Yeah. And soy sauce, I've recently discovered as a great salt bomb. Mm -hmm. uh, Let me tell you, soy sauce is really coming up in our consciousness, isn't it? About our flavor Mm -hmm. as a flavor profile and how simple it is. Yeah. Totally. Yeah. It, it can be a real help at, at the end of a dish. Fat. Fat, Kate. Fat. <laughs> fat. Fat. <laughs> Do you like that word? <laughs> <laughs> well, I've come to love what fat is. And one of the things, she, she makes a couple of really great points in her whole thesis that flat fat is about flavor. It's also about texture, which I hadn't really thought about. So I thought that was really interesting. And mm-hmm. the other thing I really... And it can also be a binder. Binder, Yeah. And it, mm-hmm. it, it own, it's its own flavor, and it amplifies other flavors. And fat, as we know, is really what makes so much of what we eat really tasty. And I think for a long time, I didn't understand that when I cooked. Mm-hmm. Yeah, so I've really come to understand that. She said the other great things I like the way she says is fat is also a transporter. So something like olive oil. You know, how many of our recipes do we start with olive oil in a pan. What do you mean by a transporter? So she makes this point that if you were to get a pan of olive oil going and a pan of water going, you heat them, and then you're to put garlic in both and then let the garlic simmer, then remove the garlic, that the water pan is still pretty much going to taste like water. But the gotcha. olive oil pan, it's you, you basically have garlic-infused olive oil now. Totally. So that it permeates and it carries it and it keeps the flavor going. God, it transports flavor. Yeah. That was the part I didn't quite okay. understand. Yes, yeah. yes, yes, I love yeah, it. Yeah, it's totally. a great idea. And yeah. so that makes me I happy. Was, I was amazed when I made scones recently and they had butter and heavy cream in them. Mm. And they were light as air. Amazing. And... It seems counterintuitive. It feels like they would be heavy with all that fat, but this is one of those examples of texturally, it can fat can make things obviously crispy, but it can also make things op- also obviously creamy, but light and flaky and tender. tender. Yeah, it's amazing. A good butter pie crust is so flaky and tender because of the fat. Yeah, and that's it's like, remarkably versatile. That's where my cooking skills aren't strong enough. I like. I wish I knew how to use fat a little bit more to like play with all of those textures. So that's sort of something I'm looking forward to because obviously texture up there is super important to me after flavor as far as making me a successful eater and making me a healthier eater in my life. Mm -hmm. I'm not a huge baker, and I think that's where a lot of it comes in is in baking. It's just so messy. And I also feel like a lot uh, of it comes in with meat too because you can definitely get the whole, you know, particularly when you think about um, what they do with the skin of a chicken or the outside of a piece of meat. I mean, the most I can get that sometimes is with if I was eating fish, what would happen to the skin of the fish on the bottom or maybe the char on the fish of a top on the, the char mm-hmm. on the top of the fish? Maybe I can get some texture that way. Mm-hmm. I feel like it happens with some vegetables like Brussels sprouts. I feel like get a similar kind of caramelized char yeah. that, that I feel that meat can get. Broccoli. Mm, yeah. I love I, some charred it, broccoli. For me. 
I love it too, but it it doesn't. I don't need. It doesn't necessarily involve fat. Mm. Whereas for me, the Brussels sprouts involve fat. Mm-hmm. And we choose which fat to use according to what we want it to do. Mm. Do we want it to be a binder? Do we want it to be creamy? Do we want it to be crispy? Do we want it to add flavor? And so depending on that, we we choose what our fat is. Yeah, that's a great idea. I was thinking what I loved is this whole idea how each country has its own fat, um, Mm -hmm. right? So we know that India will use ghee a lot. We know that Italy is going to use olive oil. And let's see what else. There's Southern. What does Southern use? They use a lot of lard and bacon yeah. fat. And this whole idea that that's just a really great way to think about your dish once you start it off. Like, where do you want to cook from? Like, what's the basic flavor that you want? What's the profile you want? And how? And she makes this comment about how the fat you choose sets you off on your path. And I think that's a really great idea. And we were sort of talking before we got on the air that you're looking at the book and there's this chart about how she just grouped things together and how to start so that if you're going to make something from a particular country, this is what you use. These are the spices that you use. These are the flavor profiles that are most synonymous with that country. And she she makes this other great comment that says that each culture and cuisine has its own fat. To make the thing taste of the place, start with the fat of the place. And I love that. The big, the big three seem to be uh, variations on butter, so butter and ghee, various oils, olive oil, seed oils, nut oils, coconut oil, and then animal fat, pork, duck, Mm. chicken. And so depending on uh, what kind of flavor and what kind of dish you're making, you would make a a decision about which one of those you're going to use. So I will sometimes for my, you know, for my beans and greens is my classic thing. I always start with a little bit of bacon and then I take the bacon out and then I cook the onions and stuff in the bacon fat. And mm-hmm. so the whole, because it's a carrier, a flavor, as you were saying, mm-hmm. the whole dish ends up having a bacony taste because there's a little bit of bacon fat in there. And it's not as good if I use olive oil or, or butter. Yeah, Kate, I have to say of all of our talking, I feel like every time you talk about bacon and bacon fat, I'm always thinking, gosh, there's nothing mm-hmm. like it. The flavor it provides there really is so true. I was watching it's so this. True. <laughs> we're going to do this. We're talking about doing an episode on things that are called things, but really aren't things. So I was watching this <laughs> vegetarian thing. This vegetarian chef make you know his form of bacon fat, and he was putting all this stuff in, and I was so bitter because I'm like, I get what the <laughs> chef is doing, but that is not going to taste a thing like bacon fat. Because even though I haven't had bacon fat in what like uh, almost, you know 23 years, I still remember what it tastes like. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And you've smelled it enough and it tastes like it smells. Yeah. <laughs> Where I live, one of the things I absolutely love is there's a lot of people on my floor that cook. So I love going out, particularly on the weekend mornings and walking down the hallway and smelling what people are cooking. And I'm like, that's the bacon fat. <laughs> Because then you cook your eggs in the bacon fat. Yes, sir. And then I can totally tell when someone in the evening has brought in McDonald's because it's wafting down the hallway. (laughs) Like, that's McDonald's fat. (laughs) It is McDonald's fat. And it's weird what you can do. Valerie Bertinelli just did a cookies on her show, or I think it was a while ago, but I just saw it again. Oatmeal cookies in which she put schmaltz, which is chicken fat. Really? In the cookies. Wow. Yeah. All right. I know. All right, VB. I once... I once popped popcorn in schmaltz as an experiment. I used I used chicken fat as the oil in which to pop the popcorn. Wow, that I bet was really really good. It really was. So do, <laughs> do you do you so do you have a preference of fat that you use or is it really do you go based on what you're going to cook? I go based on what I'm going to cook, but that said, uh, my go-tos are butter and ghee, olive oil, coconut oil, and my current favorite neutral oil is grapeseed. Mm, okay. So when I want something that has no flavor at all. I also have canola, I think, in there, yeah. you know, which I sometimes use. When I grill, I use canola more. So it also depends on that. And olive oil, of course, has a uh, low smoke point. So it, it smokes easily. Yeah. So I will sometimes combine butter and olive oil if I want to get it hotter. And it adds a little flavor. And uh, so it, it, it does depend. But if I'm making a curry and it's going to have coconut milk in it, I'm definitely going to use coconut oil. Right. So, yeah. When I was prepping for this episode, you? I was struck by how much I thought about the fact that just naturally ghee has taken over my life. 
that I just use geese so often and so much now. It's just become automatic that I don't particularly think about it anymore. I'm not saying that's good or bad. It's just sort of what happens. Because I do feel mm-hmm. like in those initial stages when you've got a little butter in the pan and maybe some olive oil and the garlic or onion, I mean some butter with onions and or garlic, and then you have that same concoction with ghee, I just like the way the ghee, it all tastes better after it's been in ghee. I feel like ghee is like a little bit better of a transporter of that flavor, I think, than butter. That's where my instinct is. Ghee has a much stronger flavor than butter, yeah. I think. It tastes to me, it reminds me of European butter mm. because it's been clarified. And so it has a higher fat content, I think. And so um, it's it's a stronger, more pungent flavor. That makes and sense. so I yeah. will use it in some things and not in others when I don't when I don't want it to be overpowering. Yeah. But it's also really good in Indian food. Yeah. And then when I obviously. do like onion and onion and garlic and just olive oil it's just never as flavorful to me as the butter and then and particularly the ghee yeah yeah and so it depends then exactly on what's going to happen next if that is a foundational flavor then you want the ghee so that it's tasty but then if you're going to put a whole bunch of other shit in there (laughs) excuse me then it doesn't matter as much now i have to mark our (laughs) podcast as explicit we could bleep it Oh my God, we have so much trouble editing these, you guys, already. The idea of now trying to figure out how to bleep that just made me need to lay down. (laughs) Here's your bleep. Bleep. (laughs) There we go. Exactly. (laughs) And this makes me think about my own attempts at cooking and becoming a healthier cook is that, and I don't think I ever really realized, (laughs) this is going to sound silly, I don't think I ever really put into words how much fat is important to me. Hmm. But it always has been. Obviously, that's one of the main things I go for more than salty. And more than Mm -hmm. sweet. Like fat's it. And for so much of my early life, I've just eaten terrible fat. You know, definitely Mm -hmm. all the stuff of processed fat and the things that make it taste fatty rather than sort of that real fat taste. So that's sort of been an interesting thing I learned from prepping this episode. Yeah. And I know that fat is considered a delicacy on a lot of meats. You have hunks of particular types of fat that, that people are intended to eat because they are delicious. I don't like that. Mm. I don't like a mouthful of fat. And and people do. You know, there's certain cuts like short ribs and there's certain things where where you're you're supposed to eat it. And not the gristly, yucky, chewy kind, but the kind that melts in your mouth. Mm. And it, it, people, you know, I understand why people like it, but it's not really for me. I get that. I get that. Um, but I like, so I like a steak that has, in terms of meat fat, that has like a really good marbling in it or something, or like short ribs that I made recently where most of the fat melts into the into meat. Into the dish, yeah. Or into That's the, yeah, yeah, yeah. That what makes I sense. like. So that it pervades everything mm-hmm. instead of a mouthful of fat. Gosh, she was making a dish. Samin was making this dish that just had, I think it had like pork fat. It just had like four different types of fats that came from meat. And I'm like, I mm-hmm. bet that's really good. <laughs> Yeah, that looked freaking delicious. Totally. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So acid is the one that I feel like I am still learning about. I feel like salt and fat I've I've had under control for quite some time. Acid is something that is the one that for me is mm. is the biggest that I'm learning about. And Samin said this really cool thing in the book about it that I want to I want to just read you this quote. She said acid is salt's alter ego. <laughs> while <laughs> While salt enhances flavors, acid balances them. By acting as a foil to salt, fat, sugar, and starch, acid makes itself indispensable to everything we cook. Oh, I love that. I love the alter ego idea. That makes perfect sense. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I came late to life to understanding or even attempting to use acid in my cooking. Yeah, it's really only in the last few years that I, when I'm tasting something, I'm like, oh, it needs more acid. Um, do you have a, a go-to for that? As far as like a finishing acid, I do lime, yeah. I do lime a lot, more so than yeah, lemon. Me too. I like just lime me a little too. bit better. Mm-hmm. Lime is a big one. And then I'm also starting to work more with, with just straight up vinegars, because there's a lot of delicious vinegars. Yes. And I have in my cupboard, I have red wine vinegar, white wine vinegar, balsamic vinegar, sherry vinegar, apple cider vinegar, and malt vinegar. <laughs> I have six vinegars. <laughs> And I actually use each of them mm. in different for different reasons, nice. and they have a different little different flavor. It's really interesting. But I feel like I could use vinegar a lot more than I do. It's one of those things. It's sort of my new thing is to learn how to be a little more um, familiar with it. You know, what I was thinking, Kate. I was thinking how I've been using vinegar so 
I mean, I've been using acid all along, but just never really understood why I was doing it or its impact. Mm-hmm. So it's been sort of fun because I'm like, I, you know, particularly when I was really working strictly from recipes, there'd always be something about vinegar. And then they, they'd always say the vinegar that I didn't have in my cabinet. And then I'd get super stressed <laughs> out about, oh, my God, can I switch it out? What can I do? Oh, my God. Then I spent all this time researching the difference between all of the vinegars. But I've, so that was sort of fun to realize I've been doing how long I actually have been cooking with vinegar and then sort of the freedom I have now with vinegar. It's sort of fun because vinegar to me is one of those things, you know, if you overdo it, man. It can be a little tough. Yeah. I also like using wine as an acid. Mm-hmm. That's my, that's another favorite of mine. Red wine or white, depending on what I'm cooking. And, you know, I've discovered um, I never really used uh, – I used wine, but I never really used um, vermouth. So I've been using that a lot, particularly in some soups. So that's been sort of fun. Which I have yet to try, <laughs> and I'm very excited about it. I'm totally going to try vermouth next time I want to use Did wine. Did you hear Rachel Ray say the same thing? She just she just said on her thir- first 30-minute meal, she said the same thing I said yes. on our podcast. Oh, my God, about vermouth and the same vermouth. And she used the same – vermouth i'm using which and she said oh my god it's thicker it's sweeter it's a little more syrupy i'm like rachel ray are you listening rachel no i'm kidding you're gonna have to remind me of what that is because i'm actually going to the liquor store today (laughs) so i want to i want to get it afterwards i have to remember to ask you uh one of the things i forget is that anything fermented is acidic yes which includes cheese so that's another acid that i use a lot a little parm you know yes that's acid you forget about those Yogurt? Mm -hmm. Yogurt, exactly. Sour cream. Um, Obviously, tomato is super acidic. Tamarind. I eat a lot of pickles. I don't eat a lot of... Yes, you do. Beer? Beer, yep. And and that makes sense, right? Because you always see beer in recipes, too. And I'm like, oh, is that just for the flavor? I'm like, no. Oh, that's an acidic thing they do. That was really informative. There was one dish I, I made... That was a steak that involved some particular type of beer that had to go in it, an ale or a pour. I don't even remember because, you know, I don't I don't like beer. But it I I tend to shy away from those recipes because I don't like the flavor of beer. Mm-hmm. But it it was perfect. Mm. It was so incredibly tasty what it did for the balance mm-hmm. of flavors. Yeah, Again, yeah, yeah. in this pan sauce, it was nuts. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And- Another thing she said is that of the five basic tastes – Acid is the one that makes our mouth water the most. Mm. When you think of something being mouthwatering, a lot of things that are um, sour make your mouth water more. So acid contributes to the enjoyment of food because it literally makes you salivate. Yes. Maybe you could. So, and what does it mean for our health, Kate? Because you probably know more about this, obviously. Um, when you've had too much acid and particularly how acid relates to reflux. Because the only time I have really think I've experienced it is when I've eaten too much tomato sauce. And I feel like I hear that from a lot, that tomato sauce is one of the things, because I think it's so prevalent everywhere, that people experience or identify as a cause of reflux. Yeah. The the stomach juices are by nature acidic, Right. right? Like we have stomach acid in there all the time we're supposed to, because that's what breaks down the food and the enzymes and all the stuff for digestion. So there's always acid in our stomach. There's two things that can contribute to reflux. One is that the environment gets too acidic Mm. by things like citrus and tomato and coffee and beer and and those things that tend to promote that. The other thing is that the valve on the esophagus that's supposed to stay shut, which keeps the stomach contents in the stomach, gets weakened by various factors. Uh, And then the stomach acid comes up in the form of heartburn. I guess So sometimes it's not that you're too acidic. Just that it's... It's... it's, mm -hmm. That makes total sense. Okay, that's just that whatever's there is coming up okay yeah yeah and but i forgot like yogurt and bananas feel like a very easy to digest food but they're actually both acidic foods which i forget about i yes agreed and now i'm thinking i wonder i feel like i eat too much yogurt (laughs) and i feel like sometimes i don't balance it enough with other things like i need to remember to keep putting a little more seeds in you know Mm -hmm. and then the salt fat and acid obviously work together and when people talk about a balanced dish that's what we're talking about is the balance of salt fat and acid so next time you're so in things like guacamole and salsa and yogurt and things that we add as accompaniments it helps us to balance those flavors and those sensations and so next time you're making something and it's not quite right consider those three possibilities because my go-to is always to add more salt and i am learning that a lot of times what it needs is more acid Mm. not more salt Yes, that's a to great To make it point. taste better. When you're in the midst of it, just to stop and think of these, of the ones we've discussed so far, what is it you need? 
Mm-hmm. And you could do a little experiment. Put a little bit of it in a little tiny dish and then add a drop of vinegar and see if that helps. You know, you don't have to ruin your whole thing. <laughs> <laughs> totally. Well, you know, I mean, one of the biggest places I've introduced acid in my life in the last, what, five years is my one of my rituals in the morning is more, I don't really like tea in the morning anymore, but I do hot water with a squirt of lime or a squirt of lemon. So not only is it good, but it's cleansing, it warms the intestinal tract, and it also helps to sort of get the metabolism going. It helps to sort of add a little bit more acid to maybe break down anything that you ate from last night. And that's sort of, as I've always said, I mean, that's one of the things I feel like one of the main changes I've made in my life that's super consistent that has added to a greater sense of my health and a greater feeling about my health. We do have to watch our teeth enamel (laughs) with lots of acidic things. Seriously, lemon and, and coffee. Things that I drink in the morning um, are terrible for for the tooth enamel, not just in terms of staining, but wearing it away. And there is actually some wisdom about when to brush your teeth. You don't want to have something super acidic and then immediately brush your teeth because the the enamel is more vulnerable for Mm. like 15 or 20 minutes after that. So after you have your coffee or lemon, wait a little bit before you brush. Have you ever drank your coffee through a straw? Not hot coffee. Okay. Cold coffee all the time. I was just reading about people drinking hot coffee through a straw. It just seems so oh, weird Oh, do you know to what? Me. I have. I have when I've gotten takeout coffee and it's had those stirrers oh, yeah, yeah. just so I okay. can keep the lid on. Yeah. I have totally. I actually enjoy it. That's, but I would never do that at home. Yeah, that's the way I hear that people use it to bypass all of this acidity hitting there at the front of their teeth. That they get it in and they get it right onto the palate and down. <laughs> seems, seems like a lot of work. I guess exactly what I was just going to say. <laughs> <laughs> it's like we know each other. <laughs> so then our fourth component here is heat. And heat refers to how we cook things. Um, we transform things by a chemical reaction. Uh, and there's a number of ways that, that we use heat. And she makes this great comment that says, the source of heat is not what matters. It's how you use it. Mm. And I thought that was really great. And she spends a lot of time in this uh, series talking about the oven and how the oven is sort of one of the more inconsistent things you can use in the kitchen because everyone's oven is different. The oven's dif- different on a, at, from day to day. So the temperature in the oven depends on what the temperature is that is di- that is outside, what the temperature is in your actual kitchen. And that most of the times if people are cooking at, say, think they're cooking at 350 degrees, they're not really cooking at 350 degrees. So she, so she said that whole leads to this whole idea that You've got to watch it. You've still got to be involved. You just can't put it in for an oven, in the oven at a certain degree for a certain temperature. You've got to pay attention all along to see how the heat is transforming your food. Yeah. The nature of an oven is that the temperature cycles. It doesn't hit 350 and stay at 350. If you set it at 350, it's cycling around from 325 to 375. It's going up yeah. and down and adjusting and correcting. And so it really does depend um, on a lot of things. And also a lot of people's ovens are off. Even I had an oven thermometer that I thought was correct. And then I got a fancy one. I was given a <laughs> gift of a really fancy oven one so that I know was correct, you yeah. know. And I realized that my cheapy one was totally wrong and that I had been trusting it. So if you know somebody with a fancy oven thermometer, get them to check your oven so at least you know, wow, it's 25 degrees off. Yes, totally. It's exactly perfect. But so what she says about that in the book, this quote that I'm also going to read again because I liked it, about this exact topic, paying attention to the sensory cues that indicate how food is cooking is far more valuable than minding an arbitrary number. Mm, I love that. See, she's so good. She really is Isn't she good. she just so good? I love she's her. She's so down to earth. She's so real. Ugh. Yes. And she's just giggling her way through that whole series. I love it. This yeah. is really funny. You know what else I think she does on this series? Is Kate and I... Kate and I have talked a lot about this whole idea, like, what would we ever do if we were on one of these Food Network shows? And they always talk about words you're not supposed to say and things you're not supposed to do and all this stuff. So I love <laughs> how many times she tastes stuff. And literally, she's like, that's so good. Yeah, she that's just so said good. it's so good. And that's all she yeah. has to say. And she moves on. And I'm like, but I love that. <laughs> yeah. Do you remember one of the Parmesan cheeses that she tasted made her cry? Yeah. Because it was so good. I want to taste that yes, one so bad. Yes, totally. Ugh. This is a really great tip that I didn't know only because I don't eat meat. But this whole idea how generally in ovens, the back of the oven is hotter. So she, when she cooks a chicken, a whole chicken, she'll put the chicken with the legs towards the back of the oven. Because it takes longer for that darker meat to cook. It needs more heat than, say, the breast of the chicken. And she had said that she learned that from an old Jack Papan episode. And I thought that was really interesting. Yeah, Ina Garten does that too. I'm, makes sense. Yeah. Because when you, oh, it's like the back of the fridge is colder than the front exactly, of the fridge. Exactly, totally. 
Yeah. That's why when I'm in a fridge, I always want to be towards the back. <laughs> <laughs> what? You've never been in a fridge before? <laughs> I guess I maybe have, <laughs> like a walk-in one. <laughs> when I was younger, all these kids in my playground always wanted to put me in a fridge. <laughs> it's because you outgrew the locker. <laughs> <laughs> and finally found my home in a closet. <laughs> <laughs> Luckily, you outgrew that too. <laughs> Thank God. So for me, the big takeaway from this episode is... For me, or from this whole Netflix series and her book and her just all the interviews I've heard of her is this idea that I love is when you think about changing your cooking, changing your cooking habits, eating healthier, however you deal with food, to remember the world of cooking can be really small and to keep it that way. And anytime you start to feel overwhelmed or I start to feel overwhelmed, I'm just going to keep coming back to this idea, this really great way that she's branded it. Keep it super simple, super sweet, salt, fat, acid, heat. Boom. All right. Well, thank you all for listening and we'll see you next time. <laughs>